as a landlord, one of the things you are going to have to do is get used to raising rents. And I truly believe if you are self-managing, there is a right way and a wrong way. And here you're going to have a conversation with Dion from Dion Talk telling you the right way and how he does it. And yes, he has the tenant ask for a rental increase and the tenant is happy. Take a listen to Dion tell you about the binder strategy. There is no one better. There is no better process. And yes, that is the lovely city of Singapore off in the distance. How cool is that? Bye. Hey everyone, how you doing today? We had such a positive response to this gentleman's last visit. We are making it a recurring theme on this channel. Let's welcome Dion to the show. How you doing, buddy? Hey, Mike. Thanks for having me here. I'm super excited about this. Hey, man, first off, if you don't know about Dion Talk and his YouTube channel, you need to go check it out. It, frankly, is one of the most entertaining YouTube channels out there We're talking about real estate. You do these great characters. And uh, without stealing your thunder, you are very, very good at that. Uh, nice jump. Very, very creative. No, I'm, I actually, I appreciate that more than you'll know. When, I, when I'm recording it, I have no idea if it's going to work. <laughs> And uh, so the feedback is actually really helpful. Yeah. Well, you've got my attention and I've been doing this a while. Uh, I think you take on topics. I think that I think I've th seen four or five of them, like, you know, cash flow or appreciation, you know, there's all these different themes, local, out of state, small, big. Uh, it's it's uh, it's very well done. Very well done. So uh, I, I'd much rather hit live and then be done where you're going to actually do editing and put it all together. I'm like, nope, that's too hard for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the things that most people don't know about me in this, they actually like really know me is I've got some memory issues. So every now and then I can space out. And if you see my office, there's actually post-its everywhere. And my phone has 10 reminders and I have an assistant to tell me when I need to be places. So if I was to do this without editing, I'd lose a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> well, keep doing what you're doing because it's working and helping people. Uh, it's very well done. To that end, I want to I want to ask you about a strategy that you have, you leverage to get tenants, yes, tenants to ask for a rent increase and longer terms. Because as a landlord, I like rent increases, I like longer leases, and I really like it when my tenants ask for them. So what am I doing wrong? Because none of my tenants ask for that. Well, I don't know that you're doing much wrong, but... Um... I talked about this on my Bigger Pockets episode, and it's really ironic to me. That was the one five-minute clip of the video that had technical issues, and it was all stuttery. They got good audio for it, but the video didn't work out really well. But my goal as a person who owns properties and has tenants is that I want to buy investments, not another job. Mm. And when you're managing tenants, if you can set expectations early on, you know, good, strong leases and uh procedures to do if there's a problem, it makes that interaction a lot better. <clears throat> so I don't like tenant turnover because that's expensive and takes time and I don't really have a lot of time. But the idea is the happier you can keep the tenant, the longer they're going to stay. So I, I have criteria that make the property attractive when I'm looking for what to buy. And then I have conversations with the tenants. One of the reasons I like to self-manage is I have I think pretty decent people skills. Um, in 10 years, I've had one turnover and that was because the tenant inherited a property. Uh, so other, other than that, I've been able to maintain my tenants except for my first one, which was a nightmare because I rented to a friend. Yeah. Uh, don't ever do that. Don't do beginning. that. That's do it bad. Once you have your systems there. <laughs> right. Um, but the, my thing is tenants have never really been involved in the decision-making process of finding how much their rent is going to be. Other than when they're looking for a place, they will, uh. you know, have a range that they'll look in. That's how, the amount of control they usually have. And the strategy in the beginning came from, I like to buy properties that are already occupied. Hmm. A lot of listing agents will say, make sure that it's empty and make sure it's the right time of year. But everyone sees the market that's going on right now. I mean, dozens of over asking cash offers, waiving contingencies. So <laughs> the time of year doesn't matter. Occupied doesn't matter, but I prefer owner occupied or already occupied because 
um, and you probably know this if you've been watching my content, I'm super lazy. I work a full-time job. I've got kids and they're a bit older now, so a little easier to take care of. But um, buying properties with someone in it already means I don't have to find somebody. I don't have to do a renovation. It's already working. Mm -hmm. So many times people sell properties because the rents are low and they're tired of being a landlord or they've inherited the property and they don't want to raise the rents because the tenant might move out and they've got Mm -hmm. mortgage payments without income. So I'm usually buying properties that are below the area average. So what I do is I call this strategy, the binder. And so far, 100% of the time, it's got the tenants to request a rent increase of over $100. Oh, wow. Um, four times, it's gotten a, a rent increase at the tenant's request of over $300. Um, and there's a follow-up where I get them to ask for a two-year lease, which helps my lazy so that next year I don't have to find another tenant or even go to a lease, a lease signing. Um, but I make a binder and I call it the binder because it's literally a three ring binder. The first page is a picture of the property with the, the, on the bottom in big numbers, how much I paid for it and transparent to the tenants because a lot of people will say, I wouldn't want tenants knowing what I paid for it. But you know, as a property owner, two months from now, you can do a Google search on a property and it'll tell you what it sold for. <laughs> so I don't mind hiding that or I have no need to hide that because tenants are the rent is a big number. So when they see 300 or 350,000 for a property or 600,000 for the fourplex, that's a huge number. So it kind of sets expectations in bigger mm-hmm. numbers. The next page is a map from Rentometer um, with my property and all of the rentals in the area that are the same size. So same number of bedrooms, same number of bathrooms, kind of comparables like a real estate agent would look for when they're looking for comps. And then each page after that, is those rentals and how much they're renting for. So uh, an example is I had a duplex I purchased where the current rents were eight and $900. I had another one where they were both at $1,000, but the eight and 900, the area rents were 14 and $1,500. So Mm -hmm. if I just said, hey, I bought this place that you guys are living in and here's a $600 rent increase, it would have done some really bad things. It would have caused panic. It would have disrupted their lives. They probably couldn't handle that increase and they probably would have moved and and nothing good would have happened. But if I take the binder and I set it in front of them and I say, here, this is the data. Here's what I paid. This is the rents of everywhere around here that if you want to move, what it would cost you. And then ask them for their opinion. I literally say the sentence, what do you think would be fair? And if people understand the idea of running of owning properties for profit, they know that my smartest thing would be to kick them out, renovate the prop property and rent it out at the highest area market that I could get. But I don't want to do that. I don't want to interrupt their life. I've already, you know, their property ownership has changed, which is enough stress. Um, but they don't want to have a huge increase. Mm-hmm. So a hundred percent of the time, the tenants have said, how about we raise the rent to just under the area average, you know, 50 or a hundred dollars less than the area average. That way they're still getting a deal and I don't need to kick them out. I don't need to do the rehab, which is much better than most landlords owners do when they buy a property. They think, okay, so if it's eight eight or $900, I'll probably uh, ask to raise the rent one or $200. And then in a couple of years, one or $200, and they slowly bring it up to where it should be, Mm -hmm. which can cause a problem if a, if an area all of a sudden has rent control and you find yourself several hundred dollars below that, you can only come up what three to 5% a year and you'll never catch up. Mm -hmm. So the eight and 900, uh, originally one requested 1350 and the other one requested 1300 since then. Now they're both at 1350 at the tenant's request. Um, And then I just kind of casually mentioned, you know, if you really want to protect this, if you don't want me to take you up to the area average or if it increases next year, if we signed a two-year lease next year, I can't raise your rent. And the tenants usually go, can we sign a two-year lease? <laughs> and, uh, so most of the time, my tenants are on two-year leases. And every other year, I will now, once they're a tenant at where I want them, the rents will go up 5% every two years. That's amazing. And my so favorite thing for go that, ahead. Yeah, go ahead. sorry, my favorite thing, I'll, then it's all yours, is the tenants are happy. Yeah. Like, 
you live in fear as a tenant. I've I was been I've been a renter in my past of the property selling and the rent being raised too much to where you can't handle it or you just get kicked out for an owner occupier or something. Um, so it feels really good to not disrupt their life and they leave the um, meeting happy. Yeah, that's it's it's an amazing approach. I've never heard of that before. Uh, frankly, it goes against all the stuff you hear from landlords, myself included, right? Many landlords, they're like, I don't want the tenants to know who I am. In your situation, you're going in, hey, you know, in theory, you could always say I'm the manager or what you could, right? But come on, you're going in saying, hey, this is what I bought it for. This is where you're at. This is everybody around you. It's, you know, it's a free market. You, you, you can move if you want. Uh, but, you know, where, where do you think we can go? And the beauty of that is, yeah, you're not going to market, but you're not having a two or four or six thousand dollar remodel, right? Turnover is what kills landlords, right? Any year I've had a bad year on any property, other than maybe replacing a roof that went a couple years earlier than I expected, it's always been because of turnover. And that's over hundreds, probably thousands of tenants now. It's always turnover that bites you. Yeah. And, I do talk with a lot of people and, and especially newer investors are concerned about the tenants knowing that they're the owner because you're then the evil yeah. landlord. Uh, so there's a few strategies that work. Some people say I'm the property manager and your leases are going to go through me. Um, other people will actually put their properties in an LLC so that their name's not even on it anywhere. Um, for me, what's worked best. And if my tenants watch this, it's just kind of revealing secrets. I have two people that have been investing much longer than me and I trust their judgment when it comes to investing or when to replace something or how much is a, a justifiable expense. So when I'm talking to a tenant, I say, um, I'm, I'm the property owner. I've got a couple of partners that I check with before big decisions. And I didn't say they're part owners. I didn't say we're all in a company together, but they're kind of my partners when it comes to investing. I, they ask, me all kinds of business growth stuff. And I, cause I run a truck driving school that I've grown from six staff to over 60 based on a couple of ideas that I had, but I trust them for investing. So when a tenant comes and says, we want to replace the sliding glass door with French doors. Can you do that for us? Let me check with my partners. That way I'm not the bad guy. I don't have right. to say no to a $2,000 expense that I would never probably do um, <laughs> in a C-class neighborhood, right? Um, so that's another way to do it where if you don't want to be the, the bad guy making the decisions and saying, no, have someone you have to check with. Yeah, well, again, let's, you're right. There's a, there's a talk track. There's a feeling, the rich, the evil landlord, the monopoly man, whoever it is, right? Whoever you put on that pedestal as you know the villain in this story, you're kind of taking that away because you're putting a binder, a physical thing in front of them. You're, you're letting them consume the data at their rate and their speed. They can then validate. I'm sure they validate it long after you leave. And they're like, you know what? We kind of like it here, honey. We've been here a while. We don't want to change our mailing address. Oh, by the way, if the, if the area average is 14, why don't we ask for 12 or 1250 or, or, or something else? And that way they, they're actually anchoring on market Instead of going, hey, this jerk just bought our place and we know rents are going to go up and, you know, let's bail because that's a that's a that's a thought that that tenants have. So you're actually, um, you know, you're, you're removing stress. You're not disrupting their lives. And you're really, frankly, becoming a good guy. If, if, if we go back to, you know, good and evil, uh, it's amazing. And, and so just a quick like less than a minute tip on being that good guy. And my first real estate agent chastised me and told me not to do this. Ah. But whenever I buy a property, my properties are in C-class neighborhoods. One's probably a B minus, but I do some small things that make it look like I care and I want to fix the place up. Yeah. You know, turning a sliding glass door into French doors is it's a huge request, but replacing all of the, the main door locks with coded locks because a class C neighborhood area person is not used to not having keys. That's a, that's a perk they're not used to getting. And I'm replacing the exterior lights with LED motion sensors. It's a $35 light, takes me like 10 minutes. Doing anything like that. And then asking the tenant, this is the question that, that has me really limit turnover. I asked them, if you owned the place, if tomorrow you were the owner, what's the first thing you would change? Yeah. And my 
agent told me never ask that because they might ask you to do something. Yeah. But most times it's something really small. Like they want screens on the lower windows because they were missing, which I didn't even notice weren't, weren't there or something small or um, one tenant. I think the biggest request was they didn't like the sink. They couldn't get their pans under the faucet. Ah. So I put in a $65 sink and that tenant's been there for six years now. Uh, so small, small things that can yeah. make a long lasting impact. Yeah. Again, what I want to really highlight here is you're, you're, you're communicating with your tenant. You're being of service to the tenant. You're not kind of like creating a barrier, like evil and, you know, the big greedy landlord, you're, you know, you're providing a service. They've signed a contract to pay for that service every month. What do they want? That's, you're just providing, you know, very good service. And it's, it's likely why your trucking company, what you've been running is growing so much because you really do think service. So uh, that's an amazing strategy. The binder strategy, everybody give it a thought, check it out. Uh, Dion, thank you very much for this. This is, this is a lot of fun. Thanks, Mike.